My name is Kurt Willems. I'm a pastor, writer, podcaster, and resource creator. And in this video, I want to talk about the challenge of revelation and the challenge specifically when it comes to Jesus. This course is called Revealing Jesus because I truly believe that this is the whole point of John's vision. The Jesus we have in the Gospels, in Acts, in the Epistles is the exact same Jesus we have in this apocalyptic text. But even saying apocalyptic, especially with our cultural connotations of that word. It adds to the mysterious nature of this book. So before we go any further, I want to introduce you to a bit of a mantra to help frame our discussion so you have something you can hold on to. And it's this. The last book of the Bible is a revelation of Jesus to John for the church against the empire during the first century. One more time. The last book of the Bible is a revelation of Jesus to John for the church against the empire during the first century. In the next several sessions, I'm gonna break that slogan down. And by the end of this introduction section of the course, you will have a big picture understanding of what Revelation is all about, especially when it pertains to its purpose. So to get us started, Revelation is a revelation of Jesus. And on the surface, how is that controversial, right? Like that's not a controversial claim. But if we go just one layer deeper, like if we were just to go one step down, controversies all over it. Many interpreters throughout the past few generations had a dilemma. Does Revelation reveal a different aspect of Jesus' character than the rest of the New Testament? It does, right? And if it does, then the Jesus who calls us to love our enemies will eventually come back to war against those enemies. So it leaves us with this weird dilemma. And the way that many people back up this approach is highlighting that Jesus is both loving and just. Have you heard this? God is both loving and just. Jesus is both loving and just. And the problem is in that version of Jesus, we divide him up into caring deeply about restorative love while also resorting to violent retribution, violent justice, a justice that will come sometime in the future with chaos of a seven-year tribulation and all kinds of things going wrong before it gets right again. And, you know, I used to agree with this as an interpretation. If this is your posture, I don't disrespect you. I just want to challenge us. There's a lot of ways we could take this discussion, but the bottom line concern I want to highlight is this. How does Revelation and our interpretation of Revelation affect our picture of God? This will be a theme that comes up over and over again in this course. I'm not going to try and answer that completely in this session, but as we progress, my hope is that it will become more and more clear that how we read this book really does affect how we see God. And I think John wants us to see Jesus. So as a reminder, Jesus is mentioned in the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And everything that John's going to say must follow that pattern, revealing Jesus. You might notice that we get our English title, Revelation, from this verse. The Greek word, apocalypsis, literally means to uncover, unveil, or reveal something. It's pulling back the curtain of the cosmos to see what reality really is and that mystery being revealed to us. With such a mysterious tone, we might be tempted to say, so, okay, John, so you wrote the last book of the New Testament and ha has something to say that uncovers a mystery about Jesus. And so clearly he's showing us something about Jesus that the rest of the Bible doesn't. So it's a mystery that he's helping us see. No wonder Jesus seems so different. And then we justify that Jesus. And although this approach to the word apocalypse, our English equivalent to that ancient Greek term I mentioned, could be true on one level, taken to an extreme, we've seen revelation wielded like a weapon, both spiritually and physically. So like spiritually, if this mystery, if this mystery about Jesus is that the world is headed for chaos and that Jesus will come back as a prize fighter or a warlord, then it distorts our picture of him from everywhere else in the scriptures. Physically, if this mystery is hyper-literalized, then it leads to the justification of war and violence and all kinds of things today. And on this note, we might remember there's this moment in Matthew 23 and Luke 19 where Jesus is headed to Jerusalem and he weeps over it because it missed his kingdom invitation and was headed towards destruction by the Romans. Jesus weeped because some of his people were zealously convinced that fighting the Romans was the solution to their woes. Jesus's solution, however, is totally different. So with this in mind, with that kind of equivalent in mind, that parallel, what does the word apocalypse mean in Revelation specifically? 
Well, in the Second Temple Jewish world, by the way, when I say Second Temple Jewish world, all I'm doing is referring to the time from the Babylonian exile of the Jewish people up to the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, an event that Jesus predicts in the Gospels will happen during the generation of his hearers, right? So that's what Second Temple is. And there's this genre that emerges that is really important. It's called apocalyptic literature. It was a popular literary device for Jewish communities and even Jesus following Jewish communities for a few hundred years. It was known for using cryptic imagery, coded insider language, clear distinctions about things like good and evil, visions and dreams. There's angelic messengers, cosmic catastrophe is usually there, and hyperbole, very important point, hyperbole, to speak truth about current events with maybe future events in mind. Now, one thing to note, is that apocalyptic writings could speak to an imagined future, but they did so with more relevance for the present moment than anything else. At its core, apocalyptic literature reveals something has totally gone wrong. The present needs fixing and God's people must resist. If the hearers and readers persevere in this resistance, they have the hope of a shared future. So like in Revelation, we'll get to this, it's Revelation 21 and 22, the world will be renewed, restored. At its core, Revelation steps into a Jewish genre that uses poetic imagery to reveal that Jesus is, in fact, the world's true Lord. Caesar isn't. The gods of the emperors, they're all empty. But here's the deal. If first century churches in Asia Minor will put their confidence in the Jesus that John will reveal in this book, then they can persevere through any hardship, empowered by Christ himself. Does Revelation reveal a different Jesus? I don't think so. But this only works if we understand that the poetic nature of apocalyptic literature must be taken seriously. So to literalize every verse does an injustice to Revelation. It would be like asking Proverbs to be historical narrative or even a wider example, right? Shakespeare to be a mathematics textbook. Genre matters. And when we get the genre right, we can excavate the deep truths of this book as it would have been understood by the seven churches it's addressed to. They didn't need a book that revealed a futuristic day when a tribulation and cosmic chaos would ensue. They needed a letter. They needed encouragement. They needed Jesus in the midst of their very current tribulations. These followers of their Messiah knew that an apocalypse about Jesus was more like decoding a political cartoon about Rome's defeat in light of Christ's victory than it was about the rise of some future Antichrist figure 2,000 plus years later who would need to be conquered by Jesus the warlord. Everything we read in Revelation reveals a God who looks like Jesus, the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Our invitation 2,000 years later isn't to prepare for the end times, but to reveal Jesus here and now, no matter our circumstances.